Hello everybody, this is David Parnoosh from the Edmund Burke School and this is a video about beginning the course uh, about psychology. This is about evolutionary psychology. In this video, we're going to talk about how evolution works and understand how that contributes to the evolved psychology that we have. So first thing we need to understand is how it works and it creates the brains that we have now. So let's talk about what we begin with and we begin with the biological agenda. The biological agenda is very simple. It is what all DNA wants to do. It wants to survive and reproduce, right? It's not that complicated. You can't reproduce if you don't survive. So that sort of usually comes first. Um, but once you've reproduced, often uh, in many organisms, right, survival comes second after that. Okay, so let's understand some of the mechanisms of evolution. All right, so how does evolution work? Well, the most important thing that evolution starts off with is mutation and variation. Many mutations, most mutations are bad, okay? So it's kind of the less important one. Um, but once in a while, you have a mutation that gives you an advantage, and that does help your organism survive and reproduce, which means that you will have, there'll be more of you in the next generation. Um, but variation is more important in, in, uh, in some you know, opinion, but like a greater mechanism, which is that there's a trait, but within that population of organisms that have the trait, there's much variation. So, I mean, I think the easiest one for us to talk about is height, right? All of humans have a height, but our height is determined by many parts of our evolutionary heritage, but there's variation, tall humans and short humans, um, and there's a big middle of humans in the middle, right? We'll talk about that. That's distribution of traits within a population, but that's variation. Then you've got natural selection. So natural selection is the idea that within a population, um, some, some organisms will be selected out by natural selection or in by natural selection. And that could be predators. It could be um, the environment. It could be lightning strikes, right? Anything that, that, causes or helps some organisms to survive and others to not is natural selection, okay? Sexual selection, and not all organisms have it, but we do, is the selection that we do on each other. So generally speaking in our species, males and females um, select to reproduce with other males and females uh, until very recently in our history, which now we can do some different things, but for evolutionary speaking, right, that's, that's the way it was done. And so if there is, and, and peacocks and peahens, probably don't even know about peahens, but right, that's a good example of sexual selection. So for some reason or another, the peahens, the females of that bird species, started being more attracted to uh, peacocks with larger, more beautiful tails. And then they had sons who had larger or more beautiful tails. And that in the next generation, there were fewer peacocks that didn't have larger and more beautiful tails. So in the next generation, you only got selected if you have an even more larger and more beautiful tail. So that's a result of sexual selection where the peahens are selecting peacocks of a certain type. And we know that there's all kinds of ways that sexual selection can happen. And it happens both with males selecting females and females selecting males. And it's different in different species. But all those things, the mutation, the variation, the natural selection and the sexual selection, right? All of those three things are going to change the distribution of traits within a population. So that's what we're talking about. So usually it's a bell curve, which looks like that, like the big hump in the middle and fewer at the ends, where most of the people, in this case, talking about people, are in the middle of the trait of some sort, and then there's fewer people at the edges. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that different populations can have different distributions. So, you know, we know that the Dutch are taller than, um, you know, the Japanese. So the Dutch curve, the whole curve is going to be, you know, shifted towards taller rather than the Japanese curve, which would be shifted towards the shorter. The same can sometimes be said of male and female, right? We know that again, going off a physical trait, that the, sh the curve, the distribution of traits in the population for height or weight for males is going to be shifted up towards the distribution of height and weight for females. Something like length of hair would not be a, isn't a trait, 
right? So that you would see a difference maybe in certain cultures, but it has nothing to do with, with genetics. Um, in this course, what we're gonna be talking about is traits like um, the ability to love or the ability to feel guilt or the ability to, um, or intelligence or, or, or you know, any number of things, compassion. Right? So any number of things are just the way our brains work with each other, but there is going to be a difference, a difference among individuals and sometimes a difference between populations as well. And what all of that results in are what we're calling the knobs of human nature, what Robert Wright calls the knobs of human nature. So the knobs of human nature are the shared universal psychological mechanisms of all humans in all places. And each individual in the population has some degree of the universal trait, okay? And we talked a little bit in the last one that that, that in, in terms of the expression of individual genes, that it's different and it's different for a variety of reasons, but we all have it. It can be, that's the knob. So the knob is our capacity to love, right? Or aggression, both. But how it's set, right? Like where is it set? Is it set to high, set to low? Um, is gonna be determined by our culture, by our context, by how we grow up, by our individual genes, by nutrition, all kinds of things. But we all have it. Um, and this, what we're talking about are people who have um, what we, I would call typical psychological development. So there are people who have you know, brain injuries or, or genetic issues or other diseases or psychological um, problems. They're not gonna necessarily, they might have knobs set to zero for something. You know, that may be missing, right? You know, psychopaths are, are, are missing compassion or empathy entirely, but that's because something is wrong. Um, but we're talking about typical people have it in, in some, in some, some uh, capacity. All right, so in terms of, of what we're looking about, how evolution worked, humans evolved by adapting to other humans. Not that we didn't have to adapt to the environment. Okay, part of natural selection for us is competing with other humans, right? And in, it's because we are a social species. And this goes back a couple hundred thousand years, all right? And because we're generally much better at adapting to the environment than most other species, our, the pressure on other humans often comes from other humans. So it's not from the predators whom we're pretty good at protecting ourselves from. It's not from the weather or not having enough food, those kinds of things, as much as the people that are around us that we're competing and cooperating with in order to survive and reproduce. So we think of, we talk about the ancestral environment, which is, goes back for most of our evolutionary history. So when we think about why do human brains work the way they work, one of the sort of parlor games we're gonna play is well, what was that brain like that helped our ancestors survive and reproduce in that environment? And to some degree, this environment is, is explained by anthropology and history and archeology, span but it's still you know, some guesswork going on. What do we think we know about it? Well, it was generally a hunter-gatherer, okay? It was generally, which meant there's little accumulation of wealth, um, not huge wealthy people, relatively, uh, flat hierarchy, but a hierarchy, and flexible hierarchy. That is to say, if we look at our hierarchy um, compared to other primates, other great apes, we know that the gorillas um, have, a, have a very you know, steep hierarchy with the, the silver-backed ape male at the top, um, but um, bonobos have a very fluid, flat hierarchy. We're probably closer to chimps. There is a hierarchy, but it's not set in stone. There's sort of infighting, there's politics, um, allegiances, uh, it can move. And it's not necessarily always based off of the strongest. Um, and in fact, uh, and we know that among chimps and we think on our ancestors, often if you got too prideful, you were brought down. And that happens a lot in, in what cultures that we study now that we think were somewhat like our ancestors. Nomadic, they moved around because they were hunters and gatherers. They actually had um, interactions with other, other tribes. It wasn't like all strangers were enemies. In fact, lots of um, interbreeding um, where you know, reproductively they would switch between the groups. Um, they would trade, they would, they would get together, they would do things, uh, they would build things uh, in large groups sometimes. Um, but the tribe itself um, was usually you know, roughly 150, generally more closely related than the people we hang out with now, right? I mean, even though there's some moving between tribes for reproduction, um, you're still talking about a lot of cousins, second cousins, aunts and uncles uh, in, a, in a small group, um, you know, which has some 
advantages and disadvantages. A lot, some type of marriage. So, you know, marriage as we know it is, is certainly culturally defined, but we are a, what we call a pair bonding species, which means that generally speaking, males and females of our species do get together for long periods of time to invest in their children um, for their reproductive success. Um, and, and different cultures may call it different, different things or organize it differently, um, but, but we are a pair bonding species. Um, and differently than, than now, of course, right, reproduction would often occur not long after the onset of, of puberty. All right, so that's the big picture in terms of how evolution works. And it's important for us to have an understanding. I'd say the big things, kind of remember, right, like the biological agenda, survive and reproduce, the ancestral environment, it was very different than where we live now and how we live now. So we have to think about, we've got that old brain from hundreds of thousands of years living in a very different kind of society now. And the distribution of traits within a population, we can't generalize. We know that everybody has the capacity to do blank, but it's not all the same. And the knobs of human nature, which is a sort of a related idea. All right. Thanks. If you have any questions, definitely ask.